Hello to all our working preachers out there. This is Caroline Lewis. Our spring fundraising campaign is off to an amazing start, and I am grateful for all of the people who have stepped up to support our work thus far. We are relying on your support during this campaign so Working Preacher can continue to be a trusted and freely accessible source of inspiration, interpretation, and imagination for preachers across the globe. A gift of $150 would provide one new narrative lectionary podcast. Any gift to the Working Preacher Spring Campaign will grant you access to additional content from the Sermon Brainwave team at upcoming Festival of Homiletics. You can make your gift online today at workingpreacher.org. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. The text for the sixth Sunday of Easter, which falls on May 14, 2023, are from Acts chapter 17, 22 through 31. The psalm is Psalm 66, 8 through 20. We continue our reading through 1 Peter 3, 13 through 22, and our reading through the farewell discourse of the Gospel of John, John 14, 15 through 21. And last week, I mentioned that we are in the farewell discourse, which we always are in the Sundays of Easter. And we get here in year A, working through part of chapter 14. And it's not until year C that you get the rest of chapter 14. Mm -hmm. And so last week I mentioned that having the perspective of what difference does it make to hear these words of Jesus that are uh, that are interpreting what what the events are going to be coming forward and and what what Jesus is going to be experiencing you know the death and the resurrection and the ascension uh, this week I just encourage preachers to maybe maybe just kind of sit down and listen to the farewell discourse, just mm -hmm. kind of experience what these words must have sounded like to the disciples, um, particularly the words that we hear for this Sunday, because this is the first reference to the advocate, the paraclete in the gospel of John, very unique pneumatology that we get in the gospel of John. And of course, John's gospel is always the gospel for Pentecost Sunday, which we'll, of course, talk about in a couple of weeks. But uh, that, and I also find it interesting too, that with this particular section, the way in which you kind of see, and I've written about this a little bit, that you kind of see Jesus sort of working out his own sense of his presence among the disciples that uh, when Jesus reflects on his own ministry and his, and what he, what the experience has been with his disciples the last three years, I will ask the father and he will give you another advocate in that he has been that advocate. He mm -hmm. has been that paraclete. Mm -hmm. And so it's an invitation, I think, for preachers too. before you even think about preaching is uh, is to how would you describe your ministry? How would you describe your leadership? And when Jesus, you know, when Jesus sits down with his disciples and say, this is how I have been with you. This is who I have been with you including the light of the world, the, you know, the resurrection and the life, the shepherd, the door, um, and all of those things, that Jesus says, I have been your paraclete, and, uh, and I have accompanied you. I have walked alongside you. I was called to be alongside you mm -hmm. as your advocate, as your comforter, as your aid, as your intercessor, as your helper, as your guide, as your teacher. And I, I love that. I love that when Jesus reflects on his own ministry, he doesn't say, well, my administrative skills were superb and I am quite good with finances, how we like, how we encapsulate our own leadership mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, and, 
and the fact that he describes, first of all, that what he has been for the disciples is this one who accompanies, mm -hmm. uh, this companion. Mm -hmm. I and then and then that companionship, of course, will not end in his departure because of the promise of the Holy Spirit. And so that that sense of where a preacher and where we feel that identity of Jesus or that the way in which Jesus describes himself as as our, uh, our as our companion mm -hmm. i invite first of all homiletical reflection on that and, and a companion like uh, for companionship sake or in and of itself right it's not it's not to get a job done necessarily or that kind of you know strengthening i'll carry you you know, as much as it is the sheer, it sounds trite, but joy of relationship or something like mm -hmm. that. That's, mm -hmm. that's part because then where this heads is toward love. Angela Parker talks about this in her commentary. It begins and ends in love, but, mm -hmm. but also this idea that the, the last verse of the reading uh, in some ways, I think anticipates the end of, of chapter 17, the end of his mm. high priestly prayer, which I think is kind of the theological high point of John's gospel, where Jesus is saying what this is all about, folks. This is my, you can tell it's my my rough translation here. What this is all about, folks, is inviting you into the same love that the Son and the Father share with one another. Mm -hmm. It's that kind of intimacy, of of belonging, of identity and connection that's what it means. I will love them and reveal myself to them. That, 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 that again, the what's happening here is an invitation of a kind of perfect love or a kind of rarefied love that only mm -hmm. God can express and God can experience at the same time. And mm -hmm. I have no idea how to explain that. I don't want to explain that. I just want to say it and let mm -hmm. people figure out yeah. how that lands with them. Yeah. And I think the you know, the other thing about that, too, is that the that love or that you can't really, you can't really explain it. Bless you, Joy. Thank you. Um, <laughs> that it is the season, right? Yeah. That you can't really explain it. But one of the ways in which John tries to capture this this kind of love that is so intimate and that is felt between him and the father and the disciples and now the Holy Spirit and, and, and really what makes this, this unitedness and this interconnectedness and this oneness uh, possible is, is this concept of abiding, right? Mm -hmm. That we get in verse 17, you know, because he abides. And of course, this is one of John's favorite words is meno uh, to, to talk about that. And so that the love that we are called to express and we, that we get in verse 21, they who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me, which is a reference back also to John 13, 31 to 35, the love commandment uh, in, in, chap in chapter 13. But the love that we, the love that we, and we talked about this last week of the, of doing the greater works than these, which is embodying love. It's, mm -hmm. you, you almost can't describe it because it's not just loving people. It's like, mm -hmm. it's like, it's like you, you abide in love. You, you're, you, the way you are in the world is this extension of this love. And it's, it's, it, you know what I mean? So it's really hard to describe. It's just like, it is who you are and you cannot not do it. I don't know, something along those lines, but it's. Yeah, yeah that, I don't that it. <laughs> it's, it's, it is, it, it becomes beyond words or beyond description when, um, there's sort of an awe where folks are sort of like, there's something about you. And that isn't a, I don't want to be around it. There's something about you. It's a, there's something about you that compels me to want to know more that, that, that compels me to want to 
abide with you, that wants me, you know, what, what happened with Jesus? Jesus was living in such a way that he drew crowds and he caused them to know that something good was happening to them, even as he caused them to scratch their head to understand what he was teaching and, and what were they experiencing and what, what was happening. Um, I think of the contemptuous society that we live in right now. And what is it that we need more than anything? is we need not um, to add another set of laws, another set of commandments, but we need to abide in the love that God has given us in Jesus Christ, which is simply those commands to love our neighbor as an expression of our love of God. And that becomes incredibly disruptive in a society where we're drawing lines, we're making borders, we're setting up new laws, and more people are feeling excluded. And, and I know that this comes around every year. I know that this is a familiar text in a familiar book. But it just seems it's a living word because we need this so much now. We need to know that God in Christ through the Holy Spirit is with us. And that in the context of all that Jesus has said, we can be the word in flesh, which is what humanity was created to be. It's beyond words. But if people see in us a community that is an inviting community because people are experiencing, I don't know what to call it, maybe love, then that's what it means to be the Christian community. Mm -hmm. I think that's what it's about. I mean, I don't know how to, um, it's it's hard to it's hard to shock people with that news i suppose in some ways right but even that line you know because i live you also will live that that's that's not just a promise about future that's not a i don't think it's just a post-mortem promise <clears throat> it's about quality of life in the here and now mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is <clears throat> excuse me again is hard to describe to somebody or to help you think about what does that look like how to coax people into that um that level of recognition mm -hmm. it's 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 sort of what we've been talking about what we talked about last week the setup of seeing this not to abstract a principle out of it but to see it as how was it experienced so these words of jesus are have an immediacy you know in a little while I'm not going to be with you. And yet I am with you always. In a little while, the world's not going to see me, but you're going to see me. And it's a promise I, with everything we've been saying today, I can't understand. And yet it's exactly why we've been telling this story for 2000 years. We can't articulate it, but we're experiencing it. And we want to use the best words we have to get it out so that others can recognize the experience they're having in Jesus. I think the, you know, the one other thing, yeah, the one other thing I would say about this and why in part I encourage the preacher to listen to, or, or just even read through the farewell discourse, but it would be better to listen to it because then maybe you'd, you know, experience what, these words that Jesus is saying to his disciples. But, but one of the, one of the effects of that is the repetition of love in this, in the farewell discourse mm -hmm. that you have, you have ref, you have, you know, John three sixteen, <laughs> and it's kind of a spattering of, of a reference to love in chapter three, obviously three sixteen in chapter eight and chapter 10, uh, but the density of that verb and that and that that lexeme is in the farewell discourse, yeah. and so it is absolutely just as God has loved in Jesus. Jesus loves his disciples in John thirteen, 
Uh, and then now we are called into that love. And so the density, the repetition of that love here is so striking. And it is that love that is going to carry them forward mm -hmm. into what they will then witness in what happens with Jesus, but also carries them forward. It is, it carries them forward as they will be sent out into the world. And so it's not an accident that this, this focus on love, and then you get the Holy Spirit here, the advocate who will guide you in that love, remind you of that love, teach you about that love, uh, companion you in that love. Mm -hmm. And so it's that love that Jesus himself experienced the abundant love from Mary of the anointing in 12. How does he wash his disciples' feet without experiencing that love from Mary? Uh, how And so it, that's the mutuality and the reciprocity of, that, of this love, that it is, it is this love that we hear about in the farewell discourse that makes possible our are being sent into the world, but also for people to see it, but also to be the followers that Jesus is calling us to be. So it's really, it's really, yeah, as Angela said, it, this week's Pericope begins and ends with love and it's all about love. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's, it, it, it sets up if, if, if we're ready to move to acts, it sets up how we go into the world. Um, if we are in the moment um, uh, certain that we are not alone, that we can then go out and offer to others what we are experiencing. Um, I'm, I'm shifting the word uh, that we would hear in Corinthians, you know, I give to you what I have received. Um, but to make it a present tense, if you can create companion as a verb, as you just did, Caroline, maybe I can create this. I love it. I love it. I um, like making up words. <laughs> so so I, I'm trying to get this. What what are we experiencing? And we're, we're experiencing uh, what we want to offer to others. And so it 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 turns away from laws of exclusion and becomes uh, an abiding community. And in that, when we look at Acts, um, I would like to see that maybe this year, if people are going to preach from it, communicate it so that folks recognize how um, it the the the. Um, the, Paul is, is speaking to these people. This is a really generous way of speaking to folks who don't share your faith, who don't understand why you do what you do. Um, you know, I'm a Wesleyan, so I've got to do my little Wesleyan moment here. Uh, e. Stanley Jones was a missionary in India, and uh, he um, it, it had uh, several conversations with, with Gandhi. And uh, they were uh, they were generous conversations. And one that always strikes for me is that Gandhi did not reject Jesus. Gandhi's issue was with the lack of looking like Jesus in Jesus' followers. And and so. I think that looking at the generosity of how Paul is describing to these people about his experience of Jesus and that as a model for how we would then go out into the world among people who don't vote like us, don't think like us, don't live like us, don't speak like us, aren't educated like us, don't have the bank accounts like us. Okay, I, I'm, I'm getting into a preaching voice. Let me stop. But, but what does it mean for us to generously sit down with someone and have them say to us in what should be a shock, the way Gandhi said to E. Stanley Jones, I actually respect your Jesus. I just wish your Jesus followers acted more like him. That's keeping the commands that were listed in John. Yeah, it's such a, the, the scene is such a contrast to last week's where, where Stephen's put to death. What the, what the lectionary didn't tell you last week was that 
the sermon Stephen gave that enraged the mob so much was uh, highly polemical and you know very much an accusatory sermon. Paul could easily have done that here. Uh, Paul, Paul had, I mean, read anti-idolatry polemic in ancient Jewish texts, right? Paul had all sorts of arguments at his disposal had he wanted to use them. If he wanted to humiliate the Athenians, criticize the, humi the, the, the Athenians, could have done so. Uh, instead, it's an incredibly generous sermon that I think requires a preacher or an interpreter to know a little bit about Stoicism, to recognize that a lot of what Paul says, the audience would not have felt attacked by, but would have been saying, amen, amen, right? We're with you, we're with you. They're with them until he talks about embodied resurrection. <laughs> um, uh, Willie James Jennings in his, in his commentary on Acts has a line about this passage that I love, where he kind of introducing um, part of his interpretation. He says, what do you say to those radically outside yourself, radically different from you? What do you say to those who religions and rituals you have been trained to loathe? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, you have to like recognize that as a Jew, Paul is probably just utterly disgusted with what he sees here. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet he offers a sermon. Uh, um, Jennings describes the sermon as, as impelled by the rhetoric of desire. Mm -hmm. And he said, the desire here is of a God who just desires to be known. Uh, that God desires people who desire idols, right? That the fact that these people are, are drawn to other forms of worship is no obstacle whatsoever for God, right? God desires them. And that's what is really at the heart of, of this sermon. So it's a really interesting look at ways of being in the world, like you were talking about, Joy, and, and how the church postures itself sometimes over against things it sees in the surrounding culture, the culture in which we live, and also how we sometimes come alongside that, how we name certain universal human longings or questions or quests that we're all on. Um, but also, you know, what's who's the God implied in, in this sermon? Um, now I'm going on. I'll start preaching on this soon uh, as well. But Caroline, what do you think about Acts 17? I like saying Areopagus. <laughs> People Which have to know where he is. Saying. They have to know he's in Athens and why that matters. Yeah. Do you think the no, Areopagus I... here is the actual location, Mars Hill, or do you think it's the name of the council that used to meet at Mars Hill? This is a, well, isn't that the debate, right? That's the that's big the debate. debate. It is the the big debate. The big debate. Yeah, I just like saying Areopagus, and uh, I've been to <laughs> the Areopagus, or the council wasn't there. So I'm going to go with the location. Uh, but that's the other interesting thing. And you're going to be there. You're, 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 you have been there. You will be there. We're, I'm on my way. You're on your way. <laughs> but um, that's the thing. It's like at the base of the, <laughs> it's, it's at the base of the Parthenon. Right. And um, so that location, but I like saying Areopagus and I like also <laughs> saying Sclepius. That's another like, that's a Corinthian thing, but you know. Can you do it again? What? Can you do it again? Asclepius. Woo! Yes, Asclepius. So, but that, but to, the geography is also very interesting about this. That that location is at, at you know in right at the the base of the the temples to, to the gods and uh and so he's you know this is all and and the fact that i mean i think one of the really interesting things too which we've alluded to and kind of have said but of course there's absolutely no mention of jesus uh except if, you know except obliquely <laughs> In righteousness by a man whom he has appointed, uh, and and of this he has given assurance by to all by raising him from the dead. So homiletically, that's also a really interesting thing that you where your where your focus of a of a sermon is on uh, is on someone or something, and yet the term is never mentioned, and so. Uh, uh, or the word is never mentioned, or the person is never mentioned. And so at the end of the speech, you go, oh, you know, you're like, oh, right. It's rhetorically, it's brilliant in that it regard. Is. So, but I don't know that that preaches, but I like saying Areopagus and I'm, I'm, I'm very much admiring Paul in this moment. <laughs> <laughs> 
That's all I got. Oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> ah, the psalm. What will we do with the psalm? Well, well, go ahead. I mean, I think there's something too. I, I, I love the image of a God who has listened and given heed to the words of prayer, mm. which is astounding in any setting that God would give heed to my prayers. Um, but in light of what is um, is taking place in Acts 17, right? A, a God who also gives heed to the religious longings of people mm. Mm. who from an insider's perspective, <laughs> uh, you know, couldn't find their backside of the flashlight, you know, I mean, from the, that's the way Acts at least presents them, you know? And so it's, it's um, this idea of a God who just desires to be known and who desires to be sought out and addressed and asked for help. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. Pre preaching goes such a long way to offer a characterization of who this God is that we're talking about. And most preachers know so many people in their congregations have to have that reprogrammed for them because their characterization of God is sometimes monstrous or sometimes just mm -hmm. mean spirited. Um, so yeah, just there, there's always every Psalm's got a few <laughs> Um, aspect of describing God that that um, that that go a long way toward helping people understand who is this this being who is this person um, that we just go on and on and on about every single every single Sunday. Well, I think yeah, and particularly when you think of it in, in through that with through that perspective. Verse 20 really stands out to me. Mm -hmm. Blessed be God. And then think about how you could follow that. How 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 might you say, blessed be God? And then what how would you, what would be why? Comma. Why is God blessed? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the and the response here, and it and all kinds of things. Blessed be God because God created the universe. Blessed be God because God sent Jesus. Blessed be God, right? I mean, you could mm -hmm. you could mm -hmm. say numerous things depending on what your theology is and how you think about who you think God is and what God does. And yet the psalmist here said, Blessed be God, because he has not rejected my prayer. Mm -hmm. Blessed be God because God has not removed God's steadfast love from me. And that there's something really quite poignant in that uh, to, to acknowledge that God does not reject my prayer. God will never remove God's steadfast love from me. And then that's why I call God blessed. And that's why I call God holy and almighty. Uh, and it's, and it's, and it's, an, and it's a, that commitment uh, to God's people that, that we acknowledge that. Yeah. And Caroline, in setting it up the way that you just did, and how would you finish out that, uh, that line uh, in, in verse 20 is exactly where that text begins. Oh, let your praise be heard. And so you've actually done, I'm, I'm just describing this so, so our, our preachers will recognize this, without doing the lecture piece that I'm doing right now, you actually did what the psalm psalm is doing and every once in a while um i think it's worth if we're writing our sermons to do what the passage is doing rather than explain it um yeah. so i just wanted to highlight that as well mm -hmm. first, first peter, peter you can preach on the harrowing of hell how fun would that be oh where that am i that be fun you both right. are like yeah <laughs> that could be fun say more matt oh goodness i was kidding but mm. you know this is um it, it has this line of course in verse where is it again like 19 uh, about making proclamation to the spirits in prison in many ways this is where the a, a doctrine of what what's jesus doing on holy saturday comes from this but this of course is not first peter's point it's not like first peter says let me tell you about about Holy Saturday and what, what happened then, uh, you know, it's this way in which 
First Peter does this frequently, where it has these theological interjections, these really rich theological statements that come kind of in the service of um, paranesis, other kinds of moral moral uh, exhortation that the, the letter gives, and it sometimes is hard to see the connection here. Um, you can talk about the harrowing of hell if you would like to, of Jesus, you know, busting people out of uh, of the underworld um, if you want. But the point here is, <laughs> the point here largely is about Christ's own, um, or, or God's own patience, right? And the ways in which, because um, there's a comparison here to Noah as well, um, God's determination, I think, to to do what needs to be done to bring people to God's self, which in some ways isn't that, isn't that far off from what we were saying about Psalm uh, 68 just a couple minutes ago in terms of God's strange uh, devotion to humanity.